here's what I want you to make sure that you definitely get out of this. He says, I, Paul, a prisoner for you Gentiles. Paul knew what the Lord said. Paul knew that the Lord had told him, if you abide in me, you will suffer persecution. Paul said, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Now you understand the theme. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our study in the book of uh, the letter of, to the Ephesians. In this letter, we've been so far, we have studied chapters one and two, and we're going to continue our study today in chapters three and four. We're going to tie them back a little bit to chapter two in particular, but chapters one and two because we're going to kind of cross the threshold today. And that threshold is if you break the book of Ephesians down into two parts, you'll find that the first half is more about what we have received from God. And the second part is what he requires of us in response to having received from God what he has given to us. That's kind of an easy way to break it down. He's hinted at this already in the first half. He's going to become more explanatory now as we start getting into the second half. And the theme that I want you to think about as we go forward in talking today is two questions. One is, what is stopping you? And then the question would be, from what? So we'll talk about that as we go forward. And number two is, what are you afraid of? Those are two questions that you should be mindful of and have answers for and live according to those answers. Hopefully today we will provide you with answers to questions you may have. If you have questions, please ask them. And even those of you who are going to be live streaming, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat. And Howard will either address them or pass them on to me to be addressed. Before we begin, though, as is our custom and is uh, something I try to teach everyone is vitally important, and that is let us come before the Lord and ask him for the presence of his Holy Spirit to help us. So let's join together, if you would, please. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of life. You are our creator and our sustainer and certainly have provided an incredible gift for our redemption. Lord Jesus, thank you for humbling yourself for a little while and becoming a man, being born under the law, coming in the flesh, subject to all of the challenges we face, all of the temptations we face. And yet having shown us the way, the truth, and the life of joy and delight and faithfulness to our Father in heaven, you have given us a wonderful example. And then you put yourself in harm's way to pay the penalty of our sin in our stead. That we, having surrendered ourselves to you, can receive from you the gift of redemption, the rescue from the chains to sin, Satan, and death. And having been set free, we now have the opportunity to go forward in life because of the presence of you, Holy Spirit, in our lives. We know we have been told by the Lord Jesus that you are given to us to help us to understand the things that you teach us and to remember them in our time of need. So Holy Spirit, we call upon you now to ask you to help us. 
Help us in a way that would expose anything that contradicts your truth that's already in our hearts and minds, that we would cast it off. Help us to receive the fullness of the food that you feed us by your word. To be washed with your living water, that you would make us spotless and blameless as betrothed to our Lord and Savior Jesus. You would help us to understand and grant us to be filled with godly wisdom and knowledge. And that you would help us to understand how to apply the word of God in our lives for the glory of our Father in heaven. And so, Lord, as we come together now at this time to worship you by sitting at your feet and hearing from you, we surrender ourselves to you. We ask you to help us in all these ways because we know without you we can do nothing. But you in us and us in you, there's nothing you can't do. What a great and wonderful God who is mindful of us for reasons we fully cannot understand, but nevertheless you are. And because you are, we want to return back to you the love and grace that you give to us as an offering to you to show you that we really do appreciate what you've done, demonstrate our gratitude, and to be taught by you to pay forward that which you've given to us, that we can multiply into you that of which you are worthy. Thank you for adopting us as your children. Thank you for making us heirs of the greatest and most wonderful gifts they can possibly imagine. Thank you for arming us with the weapons of warfare against the enemy that are mighty in the heavens. Thank you for your awesome presence. You who rule over all there is in your creation, all that is in heaven and on earth. Nothing is equal to you. And so for these reasons, we trust you. And we will listen to you and follow you and be doers of your will. So unto this end, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Ephesians, letter to the Ephesians, written by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul to those in Ephesus. And faithful in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3 is kind of a continuation of the theme that we were reading in chapter 2. So for those of you who remember what we read in chapter 2, this should be more easy for you. If you don't remember, it's going to be a little difficult. Because the beginning of chapter 2 says, for this reason. Well, that means you have to know what the reason was already explained back in chapters 1 and 2. Otherwise, you're going to have a hard time carrying on. If you're not sure what chapters 1 and 2 say and are about, certainly read them. If you need some additional assistance, you can review the video that's on our website, on our YouTube channel, XL for Christ, to give you a greater understanding of the contents of what's in those two chapters. But chapter 3 begins with, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace 
of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the, work, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth and love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, 
Putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. I don't know if you picked up the sense that the transition happens from chapters 3 to chapter 4, from what we have been given by God to now what he requires of those who have, in fact, heard him, those who have tasted the grace of God, those who claim to be his children, there's a requirement that goes along with the reception of that grace of God. Now, it's very interesting. The opening of chapter 3 says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. What do you think of when you hear that? Or does it just wash off like water off a duck's back? Okay, so one answer is that he was a slave to Christ to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Okay, what else does it make you think of? Yes, sir. So he is talking about being a prisoner in this sense is a kind of a double entendre. And your answer is that he is bound to Christ. Correct. But not by force, but by, by his own will. That's correct. So that's the secondary meaning. So that's the spiritual meaning. And you got that right. There is a physical meaning as well. At this time, he was an actual physical prisoner in Rome, under, uh, chained to a wall. Or, or at least chained in shackles so he couldn't go very far if it wasn't to a wall, writing to the people in Ephesus. And so when he says he is a prisoner for the Gentiles, so in the spiritual sense, he has dedicated himself by being a bondservant of Christ to do the will of the Lord unto the Gentiles. What is he revealing that the cost of that is to him? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Roman prison is nothing like our pansy places here. Okay, here we have prisons that are filled full of all sorts of accoutrements of comfort and, and things that Roman prisons never heard of. You are in a dirt place. And most of your food came from people that came and visited you, not because it was supplied by the government. And they thought nothing of beating you whenever they felt like it. They just couldn't beat. Huh? In the Jeremiah Meyer, what do you mean by that? Oh, into the, into the, uh, in the mire of the, of the uh, pit of the well. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, the only thing a Roman soldier couldn't do is anything beyond what his um, superiors told him he couldn't do. So if they told him they couldn't kill Paul, then they couldn't kill him. If the superiors were to give the order, he couldn't be beaten any more than they couldn't beat him either. But clearly he was still in prison when he's writing this. Well, for part of the time he was eventually put under house arrest, he goes through these stages of what he's going through because of the people who are in charge and some liked him better than others. But here's what I want you to make sure that you 
definitely get out of this. He says, I, Paul, a prisoner for you Gentiles. Paul knew what the Lord said. Paul knew that the Lord had told him, if you abide in me, you will suffer persecution. Paul said, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Now you understand the theme. You see, Paul starts this part of his letter with an encouragement to everyone who's listening to the word of the Lord here saying, what is stopping you? What are you afraid of that is making it so that you are not actively engaging in making disciples of Jesus Christ? What's holding you back? He says, look, I'm a prisoner in a Roman prison. That's what I've gotten for being faithful to Jesus. And he goes on to say, but it's for your glory. Why? Because he's showing them the way. He's showing them that not even this, the imprisonment of his body and the challenges that he faces is comparable to, to being faithful to the Lord Jesus. And why does he do it? Tells you right in the letter why he does it. He gives you a specific connection to why he does it. Let's take a look. He says in verse 2, If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me for you, in other words, his being a prisoner of Christ Jesus, being for them, is if indeed he's speaking to them in the second person. So he says, you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you. Well, this would apply to us as well. Paul's example of his life is actually part of the glory that God gives to us to understand what God is talking about when he says to serve him faithfully. He next says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. The mystery he's talking about is the specificity of which God would provide his way of redemption for us. Until Jesus was not known. We just knew God would provide a way. Abraham said God will provide himself. The lamb. Didn't know exactly how, when. Until Jesus comes. And. It's the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus that reveal this. To Paul. And he goes on to say, as I have briefly written already. Which means. Pre what we call the previous two chapters of this very letter. By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now we know what mystery he's talking about because he explains it, right? When he says, made known to me the mystery. Verse 4 says, which mystery? The mystery of Christ. which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is, has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. There are those who will dice up the word of God so finitely that they will stop when they say, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. It's not what God says. What he says is, it wasn't made known to the sons of men in the same way. That's what as means. To simile. God has now made them aware of it in a different way. How? By Jesus coming incarnate. Instead of the prophets prophesying of what God will do, he's now done it. So there's no more wondering what the fullness of those prophecies mean. We now have the substance, which is Christ. He is in no way saying 
that the mystery was not able to be known by the sons of God or the sons of men previously. Otherwise, how would Abram have said, Abraham would have said, God himself will provide the lamb? Simply. Or many things that Moses states, or the prophets themselves declare. So clearly, God had revealed, but not with the level of detail and granularity that he now has by having his son come in the flesh and show us the way, the truth, and the life, and to declare God's glory to us. Yes. Hence, that's right. We didn't know what the details were. God made it even more well-known through Christ. The granularity and detail becomes apparent now in the person of Jesus Christ. So, so he says in verse 5, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit, mm -hmm. not just the fact that Christ has come, now everybody knows, but the Spirit actually had to confirm that understanding. This, Otherwise, they, they didn't know. His comment is that the Spirit had to confirm in us the reality of Jesus having come in the flesh was uh, the event that the prophets had prophesied about now that the apostles are teaching about. It's always required the Holy Spirit for us to be aware of what God has said and the meaning of what God intends for us to understand by what he does say. That's always been the case. That's never been exempt, never will be exempt And this is one of the many ways that God declares what the role of the Holy Spirit is as one of the three persons of the one true and living God. Verse 6 says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So that there is not a separation of Jew and Gentile, that they're all one in Christ, and that is what makes up his church. Now, God's been declaring this forever. God has made it very clear that this is what he intended. When we look at some of the, the stories that are in the Old Testament and then add to that some of the specific prophets, prophecies on this subject, you will see that God actually was communicating this a lot. Some of the major things I'll point to your attention. Joseph, the son of Jacob, who was imprisoned in Egypt, marries a Gentile woman, have children together, and they become Ephraim and Manasseh, the blending of the two together in one, a foreshadowing of what Christ's church would be like. When you go forward, when the nation Israel is birthed by God through the hand of Moses, God records that it was not just the 12 tribes of Israel that were taken out of Egypt, but it was a mixed multitude that was made into the nation Israel. And God instructs them that they should be a light to the world and that their job was to show everyone in the world who their God is and how to rightly worship him so that the foreigner could become like those of Israel. And then they could come in the camp and enjoy all the benefits that God was providing. These are just some of the many ways and places this goes on. Read the book of Ruth. It goes on and on and on. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. 
He's talking about the body of Christ here. The same body which is the church of Jesus Christ. And partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Therefore, the gospel must have a component that tells us that in Christ is where this resides. He then says, of which I became a minister. What's a minister? It's a servant. It's exactly what it is. Most people see minister as, oh, that's a preacher or a pastor. No, no, minister is a servant. In our modern sense, we don't live around areas where we have those kinds of servants. So think of it in terms of a waiter when you go out to eat. This is essentially what he's talking about. The minister considers himself a servant by choice to the Lord Jesus, if he is going to be a minister of the Lord Jesus. And how does he say he became this minister? According to the gift of the grace of God. Back in chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We were talking about how do you know what the gift is? Is it grace? Is it salvation? Is it faith? Lots of arguments about all this. Does he not finitely answer that question in verse 7 of chapter 3? That the gift is the grace of God. Makes it pretty darn clear, doesn't he? So we can stop all the arguing. The gift is the grace of God. Faith is not parallel to the grace of God. Faith is a component of the grace of God. Salvation is not equal to the grace of God. Salvation is a component of the grace of God. And they, by themselves, do not fully define the grace of God. They are components of the grace of God. The gift is the grace of God. The grace of God being given is not because of any works that we have done, but the recipient of such grace, the one who has heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, verse 2, chapter 3, and has received that gift, now would be Alerted by God to the responsibility that comes with receiving that gift. It's exactly right. What was the impact on Paul having received the grace of God? He became God's servant. Now, here's the reason why this is so important, and the theme today is very important for you to reflect on. By far, most people see the grace of God as something that they receive and that they lock up for themselves. They just hold on to it. He says you have to pass it on. It's not that you give it away, you pay it forward, right? It's not that you are no longer possessing it because if I take my glasses now and I give them to Alex, I no longer have my glasses. So grace doesn't work that way. Actually, the way grace works is with supernatural multiplication. The more I give away, the more I have. And it cannot be measured with any scientific instrument. See, this is one of the things I love about the Holy Spirit and one of the things I love about people who do study the Word of God. Because then the Holy Spirit will bring to our minds the very same things that he has said, and we will think on those things and correlate them together. 
Because many people read the parable of the talents, as Alex was just referring to, or the parable of the minas, and they don't get it. They don't understand those parables because they don't go sit at the feet of the Lord and find out, Lord, what did you mean by these parables? But those parables particularly affect the one who has received from the Lord and only gives back to the Lord that what he has received. And no more. Jesus tells that kind of a servant, you wicked and lazy servant. In other words, how dare you? How dare you take it and hide it? Because that's what they profess they did. I hid it so that I didn't lose any of it. So that I didn't lose any of it. Jesus says, guess what? Now I'm taking away from you what I gave you. Because you hid it, I'm now going to take away from you that which I gave to you. And command my other servants to cast you into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's stopping you? What are you afraid of? In the last month, apart from your church family, how have you interacted with other people? And are you interacting in any way as to make disciples? That should be a personal inventory. And if not, why not? What's stopping you? What are you afraid of? Paul is saying, I have done this so consistently and so openly, it's irritated the governing authorities and now I'm in jail. For the particular purpose of making disciples of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm in jail. What's stopping you? And what are you afraid of? Think about even your closest relationships. Your spouse, husband or wife. Are you doing those things the Lord calls you to do in that relationship? If not, what's stopping you? And what are you afraid of? If you're a parent, are you comporting yourself the way God wants you to with your children? If not, what's stopping you and what are you afraid of? These relationships must be tended to first according to the Lord before we go outside. So much so that he's going to spend the next chapter teaching us all about this. That's the point of emphasis that he's going to put. And we'll talk about that when we get there. But if we're doing those things well, if we're not doing those things well, is it because we're afraid of something? Or is it because we don't know what to do or how to do it? The second one can be cured quickly. How is the second one cured? Education, training, knowledge, understanding, examples. Boy, those are pretty darn rare today of people who are faithful to the Lord Jesus. That's one big challenge. But they're not impossible. It also requires humility. A willingness and an interest to learn what the Lord says and to be most interested in doing that over whatever else is on your mind. What's stopping you? What are you afraid of? He says, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, verse 8, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Here's a question for you. First of all, 
What did God get in the deal of saving you? Did he get a good deal? Okay. An honest person will always say that God got the short end of that stick. Okay? That's essentially what Paul's starting off with here. I'm the least I'm the less I'm less than the least of all the saints. I am most unworthy is what he's saying. And you know what? He's right. And guess what else? So am I and so are you. That's why the gift the grace of God had to be a gift because it wasn't about our worthiness. Not something God owed us. It wasn't a debt. And the grace was given, he says, that I should preach among the Gentiles. What? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Now think about the people we were just thinking about that we've interacted with in the last month. That we have not been forward enough in our conversations with them to open their eyes to the existence of God and abiding in Christ. You know what we've kept from them? The unsearchable riches of Christ. And it's either because you're actually not convinced of them, or you think it's okay to hide them for whatever reason you're going to come up with. You see, if you're not convinced of the unsearchable riches of Christ, you have nothing to talk about. Anyone who tells a story they're not fully convinced about, the pressure comes on, guess what happens to the story? It goes away. Gets hidden. Gets quelled. If not abandoned entirely. See, one of the evidences of the truth of the word of God is there were lots of people who had nothing more to gain by exposing themselves as followers of Jesus to make disciples of Christ, and yet they refused to give up the revelation of the person, life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus in order to save themselves. They had nothing more to gain. They already had the unsearchable riches of Christ. And if it weren't true, those people would have put those things in the closet and they wouldn't have talked about them because it cost many people their very lives and most of them a very gruesome death. Today we're concerned about somebody's opinion about us when we talk about it. That's what most of us are afraid of. We're afraid that the person will say, I don't like you talking about that. Do you have the unsearchable riches of Christ to share with them or don't you? If you do and you genuinely love God and love that person, what would hold you back from telling them of the unsearchable riches of Christ? Pardon me? Nothing is the correct answer, sir. If you're truly convinced, nothing will stop you. So if you're being stopped, what's stopping you? What are you afraid of? What's that? That's exactly right. What you're afraid of is other people's opinion of you. That's exactly what you're afraid of. Now, those that hid their talent or their mina and the Lord came back, what did he say to them? You wicked and lazy servant. And what you had, I'm now going to take back from you and cast you into outer darkness where there's weeping of gnashing of teeth and the worm does not die. We have, being those who have heard and received the grace of God and know the unsearchable riches of Christ, the privilege and the responsibility to communicate this to those that God providentially puts puts in our life. Now, I'm not saying to you that when you go to the grocery store and see the 50 to 500 people that you stop every one of them and talk with them. That's not what I'm telling you. 
I'm not saying you hold up the checkout line to have the conversation with the person who's just uh, rung up your, your groceries and now you're waiting to pay. That's not what I'm saying. Those are what we call casual interactions, passing interactions. You're really not engaging with the person. But you see, we engage with other people in other ways and don't take the opportunity. We have deeper relationships with other people and don't take the opportunity. And then the last piece is many of us don't seek other relationship opportunities because we don't want to take the consequences upon ourselves for sharing the Lord Jesus and making disciples. You think that's going to be okay with Jesus? Not at all. It's not going to be okay with him at all, based on what he says. Verse 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The togetherness, the unity together in the mystery that is in Christ Jesus, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. And now that he has been incarnate, lived the life, died on the cross, rose again from the dead, we don't have it hidden from us anymore. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to where? The, yeah, to where though? To principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And by whom will that be made known? By the church. Now. That is not by the church we proclaim is the church. You can get that out of your head right now. This is the church that is the church of Jesus Christ, of which Jesus is the cornerstone, and all who are in his church are in Christ and meet the description he's later going to go on and give, that he gives in his very own writings. That's what the church is. And that church, abiding in Christ faithfully and serving him well, counting it a privilege to continue to serve him in the enemy's camp, among all the hostility and tribulation and suffering and persecution that will come with it, that we as the church, if we are truly a part of the church, Make known to even principalities and powers in the heavenly places. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. This has been his eternal purpose. That his church would perform a certain way. And by performing a certain way. Reveal to powers and principalities even in the heavenly places. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Boldness and access through confidence for what? Boldness for what? And access with confidence. Who, who thinks they have any idea what he's talking about? For his grace. Well, it's not boldness for his grace. Confidence. He says boldness and access with confidence. Access to what or to whom? Access is a key word in this sentence. Access to the Father with confidence because we've been recipients of the grace and we are fully humbled before the Lord. We have access with confidence to do what? Give us boldness. To do what? Yes, ma'am, to witness to others and be making disciples. So now play it backwards. If we're not faithfully witnessing to others and actively making disciples then we don't have that boldness, do we? We don't have that boldness, guess what? We don't have the confidence because our faith is not, according to the first epistle of Peter, genuine. 
course, access with confidence is much more easily derived when you know what you've received. And it's not because of how good you are. It's because of how powerful God is, how wonderful he is, how glorious he is, that he has cleansed us and made us such that we can have that access with confidence. We go to him and guess what we're getting from him? According to God, he says we're giving, he's giving us more grace. For what? Obedience to his word. Boldness to serve him well in a world that is the enemy's camp filled full of the, all of the enemy's servants. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Don't look at somebody else who has suffered because they've been faithful to Christ and it's cost them. He says, this is for your glory. This is to give you confidence. I'm showing you that I have no worry about risking anything of value that I might lose by making disciples. Because what I value is found in Christ, not the world. Because what I value is abiding in Christ for eternal life, not life in the flesh. And certainly not life of the flesh. Do you remember the parable of the seeds? Parable of the sower. Goes and sows the seeds, which is the word of God. The sower is... Pardon me? Is the soil, is the receiver, right? Do you remember why seed number two starts off by giving life and then dies? What do you mean the soil is superficial? Superficial meaning shallow or? That's actually seed number, soil number three. Why did soil number two produce life and then die? You're all saying the same soil so far, all soil three. Because of persecution, because of the word of God is why the seed dies after bringing forth life in soil number two. Soil number three is because it was shallow and the thorns grow up around it, which are the cares of the world deceitfulness of riches, pride of life. But soil number two is the soil where the seed begins to bring forth life and then dies. And Jesus says, this is because they were unwilling to endure the persecution because of the word of God. What are you afraid of? What's stopping you? You have, if you are a child of God and been given his grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus our Lord. Who would you not want to pass this on to? And what is too great a risk to take to save someone's life that they also may be partakers with you in the heavenly kingdom? For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I say this sometimes to people, and they look at me like I'm speaking some foreign language. Without Christ, there is no Christianity. Without Christ, the term Christian doesn't exist. Without Christ, you cannot be Christ-like. The body of Christ cannot exist if there is no Christ. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Anybody think they're going to get cheated? <laughs> to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. In other words, the Holy Spirit 
is working to strengthen you intrinsically so that you can bring out the glory of God extrinsically. Strengthening you inside so that you can live outwardly that which God wants you to live for his glory. Unless, of course, you're struggling with receiving that which the Holy Spirit is trying to give, trying to teach, trying to show. And he says, it's this way that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This word faith here is pistis again. Could be translated faithfulness. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faithfulness. That you being rooted and grounded in love. That does not mean we make peace signs and put flowers in our hair. That means that we have received the love of God in truth. We have given ourselves as a living sacrifice to him as an act of love back to him. And we are now interested in being an instrument in his hands in the enemy's camp to bring his love to others. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height of what? His love. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Wow, that sounds like a contradiction. It's a bit paradoxical, isn't it? To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. How can you do that? It's not a mystery, actually. Yes, sir. Cannot be found just simply by studying. How can you know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge? Being filled with the Holy Spirit is one important, critical component. What's the second? Would you say? Experience, abiding in Christ, living the life. That's exactly right. I only know the love of my wife, not because she told me about it before I married her, but because she's demonstrated it now for almost 30 years. I know a love of my wife for me that surpasses knowledge. And it's because of the close interpersonal relationship that we have shared such that I know things that cannot be studied. It becomes supernatural. It becomes the power of God in us. It's only paradoxical if you limit yourself to scientific principles in the five senses. When you realize the spiritual component of every human being, no longer are we limited by those things. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How many of you think that means you're only going to get to get there 25% of the way? How many think you're going to get there only 89% of the way? How many, think you, how many of you think that what God has just said to you means that this fullness of God means you're not going to be filled to the full. Well, then if you are going to be filled by God to the full, what's stopping you? And what are you afraid of? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, According to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. In other words, if we are faithful to abide in Christ, there is no limit as to what God can do in and through us for his glory. And the world will see that light. It may hate that light, but it will see it. And that will be it those in the world and of the world, their best opportunity to discover the riches, the glorious riches that are found in Christ Jesus. 
And if we hide it, we're being unfaithful servants and keeping from others what God from eternity past has planned to give to those who are still prisoners of sin, Satan, and death through those who are his members of his body. Thank you for joining us today on our YouTube channel, XL for Christ. We hope you like and even subscribe to our YouTube channel for ongoing edification that you can gain from listening to the messages and hopefully diving further into the Word of God to find out His truth. We also like you to visit our website at xlforchrist.org. This website talks about the discipleship process that we engage in with folks to help them grow in Christ. We hope you will join us in our endeavor to make disciples for the glory of God.